He said that God shall destroy that temple. Because He doesn't want something that's going to defile Him. For the temple of God is what? Holy. Holy. He identified that you are the temple. And if you are that temple, then He said, For the temple of God is holy, which ye are. You see, God intends to live in a clean house. He intends to use a clean vessel. He isn't interested in staying in a pink sky. He is not interested in staying in the brothel of one's mind or the waste matter of one's life. Amen. He isn't interested in those things. I didn't say he wasn't interested with those things. I'm just saying he's not interested in living in those things. He wants a dwelling place that's clean. He wants something that's not held by cap captivity, by the things and the vices of this world. That is why we talk about alcoholism and drug addiction and how God wants to set people free from that because he doesn't want to live in the same presence as the party of the world. God is just not going to politely turn his back, if you will, and say, do what you want, but when you're done, just let me know so I can turn around. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. The world wants us to believe that. The world wants us to believe that God is He's a loving God, and He is, and, and He's a forgiving God, and He is, and He's a merciful God, He is, but He's also a God that wants us to repent of our wicked ways and, and seek His face and say, God, turning from what I was to become what you want me to be. I, no longer am I going to run down the streets of sin and where sin abounds. I, I want to run the streets of grace and mercy and love and peace. Right. Yeah. Yes. See, he's just not interested in the hollow wash. There was a story told by an associate pastor to me about a time his pastor had asked him to go visit a family that had come and visited the church that particular Sunday. He said he'd never forget as long as he lived how they drove down that country road until they reached the house that he thought was abandoned, or in his words, haunted. He remarked that it was so bad that he couldn't believe that anyone could possibly even live in it. The pastor opened the door and he did likewise. He got up and followed the pastor up these old raggedy steps. He got to the door and the pastor looked at him. He looked at the pastor. The pastor just kind of looked and went to knocking on the door. And the guy said, I stepped back because I thought the house was going to collapse. A few seconds later, the door opens. And a young man greets them and says, come on in. And as the pastor enters in, he began to weave his way through the literal maze of newspapers, toys, old furniture, junk, dirty dishes, clothing, you name it, it was there. He said, all I could do was follow, because it was a literal path. Things were stacked up waist high on both sides of this literal walking path through the home. The father called from us to us from the kitchen. Realizing that that was the only place they could possibly be because they already gone past the dining room and the dining room was full. And as they began to walk in there, they reached the kitchen and the father said, take a seat. But he said, all I could remember was the stench of the animals and the spoiled food that lay on the countertops and, and the trash smell that filled the air. And I remember asking myself, Frank, uh, how in the world can people live in this? How in the world can people live in such conditions? And, and I wonder sometimes as a pastor if that's what God is thinking about our temples from time to time. I wonder if that's what He's saying. How can I ever take up residence here? How when the mind is filthy with the corruption of this world and, and they're filthy with the bloody lucre of society. All they watch is that vileness that comes off of that television or the videos that are being plugged in that their kids and their family is uh, incorporating into their lifestyles. Hear me 
church this morning, there's something about the mind that God gets inside of and He looks around and He said, Man, there's a lot of work to be done here. But I also want to remind us this morning that our God is not a housekeeper. No, my God is a resident. My God can and does a good job when He needs to clean house. But usually it's the preacher that brings forth the Word of God and he says, Sister, here's your broom and here's your handkerchief. Go on, go clean your house. It's not me to do. I'm not to walk to your home and start cleaning things out. I say, Sister, go ahead. The handkerchief is yours. Walk on home today. Why? Because you walk into a church, somebody preached the Word, and the Word said, I need to change. I need to change things in my mind. The things I do, the things I say, the places I go. God is not your housekeeper. Uh Uh-uh. And that's what society does. They say if God don't want it in there, God will take it out. That's why we find so many drunkards in church today. That's why we find so many people that smell like they walk out of a bar in church today. I'm not uh, preaching against them. All I'm saying is that when we become the temple of the living God, hear me, you will and shall become holy and acceptable unto God. Not unto the pastor, not unto the church, but unto the God of your salvation. Talking about revival this morning. Leviticus 10 and 10 says, And that you may put difference. Everybody say difference. Difference. Come on, say it with me. Difference. Difference. That you may put difference between holy and unholy. He didn't say that I would put difference. The Lord said that you would put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean. Between the things that belong to me and the things that don't belong to me. The things that I like and the things that I don't like. I'm not going to do it for you. Church, we have to do it for ourselves. We have to do it for our children. We have to do it for our grandchildren. We are responsible for putting a difference between the things that belong to God and the things that don't. 1 Peter 2 and 9 said, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means a nation or a people or a church or an entity that what belongs to me. I want the world to know that you belong to me. When you walk into your job place, they need to know that you belong to me. Because I can see it all over you. I can hear it the way you speak. I can see it the way you work. You are a child of God. I look at some of our churches. You know, Pastor, I love everyone. And I love the things of God. But I love the things of God more than I love everyone. Because there's no one in this world that can save me but the Word of God. And so it's not that I'm hateful in any aspect, right. but I am grateful that God has left me a, 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 a plan. Yes, amen. If we don't become a separate nation, if we do not allow God to identify in us and with us, then I ask you today, who is he going to identify with? Because he is with somebody. Paul reminded us in Ephesians 5 and 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 